in, uh, introduce you um, just about uh, a minute or so. Okay. And, and then I would uh, let you uh, uh, talk about yeah. I think, uh, you you mentioned about about half an hour or so. Yeah. And uh, I will invite the audience also in my intro to post uh, questions in the chat. And uh, I will see uh, what we have there, or we are just asking people to ask questions uh, right after. Perfect. That's great. Wonderful. Okay. Wonderful. Wonderful. Excellent. So thank you for. Can you for tell me in one minute about your about the group, the sustainable uh, College committee. College committee, yeah. Yes, uh, so we are uh, a sustainability committee. Um, it kind of like is my brainchild. A little yeah. Bit. Uh, we are a small college, right, with uh, a lot of uh, more press, supposedly more pressing issues there, right? So sustainability is sometimes not on the forefront. But oh, it should be. <laughs> but yeah, it should be. And I think everybody, especially our sponsors, the Adrian Dominican sisters are very uh, behind the idea, right? So it's right. getting to, to experience that sustainability will actually also uh, open the door for other issues that seem to be much more pressing right now, right? So that's a little bit <clears throat> the long haul, I think. What we as a committee <coughs> try to do uh, at our small school here. Fantastic. How many students are there in the college? Uh, about 1,400 with 1400. satellite campuses included. The uh, main campus alone is probably around 1,000. Uh -huh. And are you in, a in Adrian yourself? In Adrian, Michigan, yes. Uh -huh. OK, very good. Wonderful. Yeah, I, I know that you are from the Detroit area. Right? I'm a Michigander from Oak Park, Michigan, so I'm happy to be home for the evening. <laughs> okay, wonderful, wonderful. And uh, yeah, I, I didn't really mention that in my short, what I, a note that I wrote down, but well, I'll, I'll make the point if you don't, that's fine. <laughs> I forget about that. Good, good, wonderful. Okay, so I think uh, I'd only see one person uh, that I can't really identify by the number, but I think I admit everybody to the meeting now. Okay, and, wonderful. Uh, and we are ready to go. Great, thanks so much. Okay, so here we go. Oh, that's great. And then I will also make you co-host here. So if I find you now again, that's, uh, should have done that earlier here. <laughs> We do have good attendance, which is always good. Very nice. So let me see. I, I think I can type your name in here. That goes fat faster here. OK, here you go. And let's see more. Make co-host. So this way, you should be able to share your screen when we get there. Good. I, actually, I'm just going to speak, so I won't even uh, share oh, the screen okay. other, other than me. Okay, so that's very similar to the unusual presentation we had once with uh, 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 Tony Annette, Anthony oh, Annette. Yeah. Uh, uh, he was also speaking completely freely, uh, his presentation on Laudatio C. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Oh. He's, uh, you know, he he and I are teaching together actually uh, this semester. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. So he moved on to another like full time position, but he's still at the uh, at the uh, uh, Col at Columbia also. He he was on leave from the International Monetary Fund, and then he uh, rejoined the IMF, uh, and now he has retired, and he's teaching at Fordham. Uh, but online. So he's oh. in Washington, but he and I are teaching a class together at Fordham University. Okay, wonderful. Yeah. wonderful. Okay, good. So uh, welcome everybody in the audience uh, for this uh, uh, winter uh, semester 2021 ISA endowment uh, speaker series on the environment. We're very uh, excited to have uh, Dr. Jeffrey Sachs uh, as our speaker tonight. Uh, just very briefly, a little intro, and then I let uh, Dr. Sachs uh, speak for himself and uh, take it on. 
Uh, Jeffrey David Sachs is an economist and former director of the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He's known as one of the world's leading experts on sustainable development and the fight against poverty on our planet. Sachs is currently director of the Center of Sustainable Development at Columbia University and president of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network and authors of numerous books and articles. Tonight, Professor Sachs will speak about the role of universities in sustainable development and the lessons learned by the COVID-19 pandemic. Please join me to give Professor Sachs a warm welcome. Tom, uh, thank you very, very much. And uh, good evening to everybody. Thank you for inviting me into your virtual home. Uh, and uh, thanks so much to the Sustainable College Committee of uh, Siena Heights University. It's a pleasure to be with you, but also a special pleasure because I am a Michigander, uh, uh, born and raised not so far from Adrian uh, in Oak Park, Michigan. So I have a very uh, warm feeling uh, to be together with you uh, this evening. Uh, I also uh, am delighted uh, to, to be uh, with the Siena Heights University and with the Dominican Sisters commitment to sustainable development. A lot of my work uh, in recent years has been uh, together and in service of Pope Francis and the Vatican's efforts for sustainable development. Uh, I work closely with the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. And that remarkable uh, pair of institutions has done uh, a profound uh, contribution to sustainable development globally, uh, helping to prepare the way scientifically uh, for Pope Francis's uh, stunning, uh, beautiful uh, encyclical Laudato Si uh, and uh, the contribution of Laudato Si to our topic of sustainable development is enormous. Uh, as you know, not only is Laudato Si a profound meditation on the uh, reasons for sustainable development, but it's a very practical contribution to helping the world find agreements on how to achieve sustainable and integral human development, as Pope Francis uh, puts it. And when Laudato Si was uh, published in 2015, it played a very big role in helping the world get to the agreement reached in Paris in December 2015, the Paris Climate Agreement. And we are absolutely uh, indebted to the Paris Climate Agreement for any hopes that we have, and I think we do have real hopes now, to find a pathway to sustainability and to climate safety. So that's the topic that I'd like to speak about this evening. What is sustainable development? Uh, why is it so hard? Uh, how are we going to find a path to achieve sustainable development? And what is the role of colleges and universities in helping to find that path? Sustainable development, uh, in my understanding of uh, the term and the way that I like to apply it, means a society that achieves three simultaneous and important objectives, one of which is economic prosperity or well-being for the people in the society. The second is social justice and social inclusion. We like to say in the UN context, uh, no one left behind. And the third objective is to do this together with environmental sustainability. And these are the uh, 
triple commitments that the world governments, the 193 UN member states of the UN adopted in September 2015, when they adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And then a few weeks later, as I mentioned, when the same governments adopted the Paris Climate Agreement. The SDGs, as you may know, are the commitments that every government has taken on to make the world more sustainable by 2030, uh, promising major advances in reducing or ending poverty, hunger, uh, lack of access to schooling, lack of access to safe water and sanitation. In other words, to overcome many of the uh, barriers of deprivation that exist in the world and to combine that with a new pathway of environmental sustainability. And I should mention also that on that glorious day of September 25th, 2015, when the 17 SDGs were adopted, Pope Francis spoke at the United Nations to the world leaders in a special session uh, that he led. And then it was at the very uh, conclusion of his remarkable address that the world leaders stood, applauded, and adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, Pope Francis's uh, great moral uh, leadership played a unique role in the adoption of the SDGs. Well, why did the governments adopt the SDGs? The main reason is sustainable development is not something that happens automatically. It's not the result of the invisible hand of the market, as is sometimes said, because the market economy by itself does not produce sustainable development, unfortunately. The market economy generates a lot of wealth, but it does not distribute the wealth in a socially just way. And it does not protect the environment by itself because in the normal course of business, uh, unless businesses are really regulated properly and geared properly to sustainable environmental practices, unfortunately, they treat the environment as an open dumping ground and the atmosphere as an open dumping ground for greenhouse gas emissions, which are the gases, including carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, that are changing the climate in such a dangerous way. So unfortunately, the market economic system by itself not only does not guarantee sustainable development, it doesn't even uh, hold out the hope of achieving sustainable development unless governments actively manage, make public investments and regulate the economy and tax and redistribute earnings of the rich to help the poor so that we achieve that triple bottom line of economic well-being, social justice, and environmental sustainability. This is a big challenge. And the world's governments adopted the 17 SDGs and the Paris Climate Agreement, I think, uh, because they were scared that inequality was and actually continues to be rising to extraordinary, unprecedented, and dangerous proportions. We have a few hundred uh, Americans who have trillions of dollars of net worth, and we have 100 million Americans that have no wealth at all and that are struggling to put food on the table. And so the inequality that the market system has produced has reached a level that is extraordinary and unprecedented in history. And the governments also recognize 
recognized in adopting both the 17 Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement, that we have reached a point where the economic activity is so global, so large, $100 trillion of output per year, and so uh, heavy in its impact on the physical environment that we're facing not just one, but multiple deep, unprecedented environmental crises. We're facing, obviously, the crisis of climate change. We have warmed the planet through the release of greenhouse gases, especially the burning of coal, oil, and gas, the three fossil fuels. And the planet is now already 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial temperature. We're warmer than in any time during the past 10,000 years. The whole period of civilization was in a climate that we now are no longer experiencing. We're now out of the whole uh, band of climate of the entire period of civilization because we have warmed so much. And the warming continues at an even accelerating rate of between 0.2 and 0.3 degrees Celsius every decade. And science and our own eyes and experience tell us that this is becoming absolutely terrifying. Sea levels are rising. Extreme hurricanes are coming with increasing frequency. There are more droughts, more floods, more extreme heat waves, more extreme forest fires than ever before. And it's going to get worse unless we head off that crisis. But that's only one of the four major environmental crises that the governments recognized when they signed on to the Paris Agreement. Because the second major environmental crisis is the destruction of biodiversity. In regions around the world, in ecosystems like the Amazon basin, the impacts of agriculture, typically farming, pasture lands, ranch lands, are so pervasive that it's leading to a massive deforestation. And that's true in all of the rainforest regions of the world, the Amazon, the Congo Basin, uh, in Indonesia and Malaysia, in Southeast Asia. And the destruction and the uh, collapse of biodiversity of innumerable species uh, is at an unprecedented and really dangerous, terrifying rate. But that's not all, because the third major environmental crisis is the mega pollution. Air pollution itself claims between 5 and 10 million premature deaths every year, especially in places that are burning a lot of coal or a lot of fossil fuels, a lot of automobile congestion, and a lot of industrial production. And the pollution of the oceans, especially the plastics pollution, the pollution of the soils with huge use and not very accurate use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides are all contributing to mega pollution. And even that, together with the biodiversity loss and the climate change, is not the full story because COVID-19 has also shown us in the most painful possible way the dangers of natural disruption in spilling over to new diseases. We've had since the year 2000 several new emerging diseases that are all a reflection of the dislocations of the natural environment and humans coming into contact with animals that are harboring viruses or other pathogens and transmitting them to human beings. In the case of COVID-19, this is 
almost surely a, a virus that originated in horseshoe bats in Southwest China, probably infected some mammalian uh, intermediate species, perhaps got into the Chinese uh, food chain and then was transmitted to human beings in the outbreak that began last uh, December, 2019 in Wuhan, China. And we've also had SARS, uh, we've had uh, recombinant influenza H1N1, we've had MERS, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, we've had Nipah virus, we've had more outbreaks of uh, Ebola, which is also a bat transmitted disease. The bat is the reservoir fruit bats uh, in uh, equatorial Africa and then transmitted to human beings. Well, to put all of uh, this together, my point is that the governments adopted the sustainable development goals and they adopted the Paris Climate Agreement because things were not working properly. We were making more and more wealth in the world, but we were not achieving well-being. We were not achieving social justice and we were not achieving sustainable environmental systems. This of course is what led Pope Francis to uh, prepare Laudato Si, which is a remarkable document. I uh, like to emphasize that it can be taught in uh, a philosophy course, it can be taught in an ethics course, it can be taught in an environmental science course, it can be taught in a course on public policy because it's so rich and encompassing and holistic in its vision, saying that we are stewards of the planet. And as Pope Francis says, our interdependence obliges us to adopt a global plan for our common home. So Pope Francis emphasizes the need for a shared plan on the planet in order to confront these interconnected challenges. Well, let me bring us up to today uh, and uh, where we stand on this. It's been a very difficult period, not only getting up to the uh, adoption of the SDGs and the Paris Agreement, because they reflect already a growing emergency that had not been attended to in the years leading up to 2015. But then we had a very difficult period in this country and in our international relations with the rest of the world uh, during the Trump administration, because Donald Trump did not want to follow any of those agreements. Uh, he gave an executive order that actually removed the United States from the Paris Climate Agreement a rather shocking move actually, and a very dismaying one, because the United States was the only country of all 193 countries that turned around and walked out the door between 2017 and 2020. And I know because I work all over the world that this was completely shocking and completely dismaying to the rest of the world. It was not based on any sound judgment. It was not based on any moral view. It was not based on any scientific conclusion. And in my opinion, it was based on false premises because Trump said that the Paris Climate Agreement was not fair to the United States. But when you read the Paris Climate Agreement, the U.S. isn't even mentioned. It's an agreement that is symmetrical for all 193 countries in the world. So there's no way that it's unfair to just one country. It doesn't even identify individual countries separately. But this is what Trump thought and or claimed uh, or gave as an excuse. And he pulled the US out of the Paris Agreement. And he didn't want to reduce the greenhouse emissions. He didn't believe in renewable energy. He didn't believe in pollution control and regulation. And so the result was we lost another four years. Crucial 
years because the earth is warming, the species are being driven to extinction, the pollution is poisoning our air, our soils, our land, our waterways. We don't have time to lose, but we did lose those four years. Now, with President Biden, we have an administration, thanks God, that is taking these issues seriously. And the first thing that President Biden did when he came into office was rejoin the Paris Agreement. And then he did something very important last week, really uh, very inspiring in my view, and also very successful in my view. And that is he invited 40 world leaders who together represented by my count 86% of world economic output and about 76% of the world population and roughly 80% of all the greenhouse global warming emissions of the world. So including China and India and Russia the European Union, Canada, United Kingdom, Brazil, Indonesia, big countries that are both contributing to the world economy and also contributing to the greenhouse gas emissions, he invited them to the White House for a climate summit. This was very important, especially since it was the first time since uh, Trump was elected uh, that we've had that kind of leadership from the US. I liked it even more because he invited them to the White House, but he did it on Zoom, just like we're doing. And it saved a lot of uh, greenhouse emissions, not having to fly all these world leaders someplace. They were able to speak to each other. I've, I think uh, since we can do Zoom, I, I want world leaders to do Zoom routinely also so that they can get to know each other, cooperate with each other, find a way forward. And that's what President Biden did. So what was the outcome of that to bring us up to date? The United States and many of the uh, most important economies of the world agreed in the climate summit, either announced or uh, reiterated their previously announced commitments that they would decarbonize their economies by 2050. Or in the case of China, uh, President Xi Jinping said no later than 2060. And I hope 2050 because China could and should uh, come in uh, by 2050 as well. So the United States is on record now with President Biden with the commitment to decarbonize the economy by 2050. The same is true of Canada, the United Kingdom, the European Union, Japan, Korea, China by 2060. And most of the other countries said, they know, they know, they have to do this, but they haven't yet reached that point. But I do believe that we are at the tipping point where governments all over the world will set plans now to decarbonize by 2050. Now, why are they adopting that goal? Because that, the scientists tell us, is really the last chance to keep the global warming to below 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the 21st century. We might overshoot 1.5 degrees and then gradually come down below 1.5 degrees warming, comparing Earth's temperature with the temperature of the years 1750 to 1800, the pre-industrial period, because we need to get the temperatures back down closer to our experience of civilization. We're going to really want to drive the temperatures down, not just to 1.5 degrees warming, but down to one degree later on. But we're so uh, much on a warming trajectory now. We can't get there so fast uh, without a profound economic uh, crisis. So getting to uh, net zero greenhouse emissions by mid-century and then to negative emissions because we will take 
the CO2 out of the air and store it back in the trees, the plants, the vegetation, the soils afterwards, after mid-century. That's the idea that the governments have agreed to. And I'll just to finish this brief introduction to say that uh, it's feasible. And what President Biden has announced is absolutely the right thing for the US to do because it is feasible, it's not expensive, it will keep us competitive and American industry will also play a role actively in helping other parts of the world to decarbonize as well. Briefly put, what we need to do in the US and everywhere is shift our production of electricity from natural gas or coal or oil to wind, solar, hydro, or in some states, uh, there'll still be some nuclear power plants as well, but all zero carbon power generation. Then the second thing we need to do is to convert our automobile fleet to electric vehicles from internal combustion engines. And as you know, uh, as Michiganders, uh, the uh, U US auto industry is really gearing up for this. General Motors has said basically by 2030, it's going to be selling ele all electric vehicles or nearly so. The third thing we need to do is to convert our homes by retrofitting or new building standards to be heated by electricity rather than by home heating oil and to use electricity for cooking substantially rather than gas. We're going to also want to use our clean electricity to produce other clean fuels. For example, hydrogen, because hydrogen, which can be produced with clean electricity and water by dividing H2O, splitting H2O into hydrogen and oxygen, and then using the hydrogen, that can be used in heavy industry. It can be used in heavy trucking. It can be used in ocean transport. And that will be another important part of decarbonization is a hydrogen economy. So we have our work cut out for us. There are a few sectors <laughs> that are still <laughs> unsure technologically exactly what we're going to do to get them to zero. Aviation is one because with aviation, uh, we can't electrify long flights, uh, but probably we can produce synthetic uh, aviation fuel. Uh, in order to uh, power uh, the airplanes. And Boeing has said that it's going to start converting its planes to net zero emission planes uh, in the 2030s. So this framework makes sense. The world is coming around to it. We will all get together, all the governments, now that we're back in the Paris Agreement, we will rejoin the other 192 governments to meet in Glasgow, Scotland at the beginning of November this year for so-called COP26, the Conference of the Parties 26th session. The first one was uh, in Berlin in 1995. So now we're the 21st. And that will be in Scotland at the beginning of November. And my hope is, and the UN's work is to have all governments arrive in Glasgow with the clear plan of action to get to net zero emissions by mid-century. Finally, uh, let me say a quick word about us as universities. What is our role? Of course, uh, we have multiple roles. Our, uh, our uh, major responsibility is education to help our students both understand the moral imperative the Laudato Si imperative of stewardship, and also the technical, the scientific arguments about climate change, and also the public policy strategies to achieve sustainable development. Another part of our goals should be, of course, supportive research to understand how 
these uh, ambitions can be achieved and to understand the Earth's climate system and biodiversity with the more scientific knowledge and scrutiny. And our third role, I believe, is to work with governments and business to help make this transformation as effective, as low cost, as socially fair, as efficient as possible. And I believe all of those objectives can be achieved. And universities are great conveners. Universities uh, can bring together all the stakeholders, government, civil society, moral leaders of uh, religious uh, communities, our students, and our government officials to work on just strategies and effective engineering strategies so that we can determine that pathway to sustainability. Let me thank you again for the chance to share some remarks. I want to go to our discussion, but we have a lot we can talk about, both the uh, practical public policy, the global environment politically, uh, the global environment physically, uh, the rest of the 17 sustainable development goals, including the fight against poverty. But uh, let's open it for discussion. And let me thank uh, you again uh, at Siena Heights University for your care, concern, and leadership uh, to help uh, the world to achieve sustainable development. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sachs. This was a fantastic presentation. We have a few questions that came in uh, during the talk. Uh, the first one from Ron Carders. Uh, he says, great presentation so far. Uh, no, that was actually to me. I think he did <laughs> a question also. Oh, here, actually, Chess Garcia. Uh, what are some actions that are being done to break the racial injustice in environmental development? Uh, this is a, a, a really great question. Uh, you know, uh, a, a, a very powerful book uh, that one can read about the racial injustice uh, on the environment is a book by Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law. Uh, and I am having a, a, a series of interviews this year. I call it a book club. You could find it online or as a podcast where I'm uh, speaking with authors uh, of uh, great new books uh, about their work. And I had the chance to interview uh, Richard Rothstein about the color of law. This is a, a book that describes the racial injustices in the United States uh, that government actions created for what he calls de jure segregation or segregation by law, not only by fact, but by law. And the United States, of course, had many uh, such laws on the books that led to uh, uh, a segregated society. But one of the phenomena that uh, Richard Rothstein discusses at length is about how minority communities were pushed to uh, live in the polluted parts of town, or whenever a new factory was to be sited, uh, it was sited in minority communities. Uh, the result being that minority communities face the pollutants, they face the environmental hazards. Uh, and of course, this was part of the overall injustice uh, of a highly segregated society that violated all of our principles and constitutional norms for such a long time in the United States. So we need to make sure that as we build our future, that our land use policies, the siting of infrastructure is done transparently, fairly, justly, and that we remedy uh, many of these uh, conditions uh, that exist today, which will tend to happen 
because we will be closing down a lot of the most polluting industry and certainly the fossil fuel based sectors of the economy over the next 30 years. And then we'll have the chance for building forward in a socially just way. Interestingly, for me and for your question, today I had a uh, long converse, extended conversation with a team in the US Department of Energy, which is specifically working on the challenge of ensuring social justice in the transition period to a clean economy. So precisely the question you're asking, there is a team dedicated to this in the Department of Energy, and we were discussing how to make sure that the uh, trajectory of decarbonization is done in a racially just and socially just manner. Thank you, Dr. Sachs. And uh, the Secretary of uh, Energy being also a Michigander, uh, you have kind of like also that connection to- Absolutely. <laughs> Good. Uh, I, there's one more question in the chat uh, and more coming in actually right while I speak. Uh, I think the next was from F uh, Felicia Wu. Thank you for this great talk. Are there efforts on other greenhouse gases besides carbon, uh, uh, for example, methane emitted by agriculture? Yeah, great question. So uh, I cheated in my talk, as you caught me. Uh, it's not good enough just to get down to zero for CO2 uh, or even negative by storing the CO2 uh, back in the biosphere. We have to end all of the greenhouse emissions. And the main greenhouse emissions, as I mentioned, uh, number one is CO2, about 70 or 75% but also the most dangerous because the carbon dioxide, when it's emitted, stays in the atmosphere for centuries or even millennia, whereas the other greenhouse gases have a, a much shorter residence time. The uh, second major uh, gas is methane, in fact, uh, something like 15% of the total, maybe even a little larger because certainly some of the methane that is released uh, is not actually reported. And scientists have been very puzzled. Why is the methane concentration higher than we think it would be given the identified emissions? And the reason is most likely that there are a lot of emissions that are not being reported, including the methane that leaks from the natural gas pipelines, for example, the so-called fugitive gas. Now, methane is a highly potent uh, greenhouse gas. Per molecule, it is 23 times the uh, radiative forcing, that is the warming uh, force of carbon dioxide. It doesn't last in the atmosphere as long, and it has not built the concentration to the same extent as CO2, so it doesn't have the larger share of the warming attributed to it, but it's a very potent greenhouse gas. Now, what should be done about it? Uh, methane uh, results from several uh, phenomena, partly is natural gas production itself, uh, both the, the production of natural gas, the flaring, uh, the fugitive gas that is released uh, is a major contribution to the overall methane increase. Uh, land sites, landfill, uh, with, with the anaerobic uh, um, respiration around organic waste emits methane from uh, waste dumps. And that's why we need uh, much more systematic recycling uh, and uh, biodigesters for organic wastes rather than uh, landfill. But then agriculture, as you noted in the question, plays a very large role uh, and in multiple ways, partly crops, especially uh, wet uh, rice production because methane is released in anaerobic respiration in paddy fields. 
in submerged uh, rice fields. And of course, methane also comes from the ruminant animals, especially from uh, cattle, uh, beef production. And <clears throat> that is a, a major factor. The third of the greenhouse gases is nitrous oxide. And uh, that comes from many sources also, partly from the fertilizers that we use, the nitrogen-based fertilizers, uh, which are volatilized in part as nitrous oxide, partly from combustion processes uh, that uh, give rise to <coughs> nitri uh, nitrous oxide. So, and then, uh, then there's a series of fluorine gases, uh, including hydro, uh, uh, HFCs, uh, which are uh, hydrofluorocarbons, which were the replacement to the CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, which were the refrigerants causing ozone depletion. So we went from CFCs to HFCs to stop the ozone depletion, and that's been a successful enterprise. But the HFCs are also greenhouse gases. So now, what can I say uh, about all three of those categories? When it comes to methane, aside from getting out of fossil fuels, and that includes natural gas, very important, uh, we have the questions of methane from agriculture. And one issue, very contentious, is beef consumption uh, because uh, beef uh, as uh, uh, produced now emit uh, a lot of methane and at the same time the evidence is that in the united states and in europe the per capita beef consumption is so high that it's unhealthy for us and so a lot of people are shifting diets uh, more towards uh, plant proteins. And it's a healthier diet. A lot of the plant proteins, as you know, are now being uh, redesigned to taste like meat, the Impossible Burgers and the Beyond Burgers, uh, which are very good, by the way. Uh, I know, I like them. Um, and uh, this is uh, one way that uh, it would be possible to reduce emissions. Uh, it's a uh, controversial uh, part of uh, this agenda that uh, we're going to have to have a pretty prolonged and serious discussion in a country uh, that loves its hamburgers uh, and loves its beef. But uh, this is definitely uh, something that uh, is uh, on the table, so to speak, for uh, discussion. And a lot of people, uh, it's actually a quite significant uh, shift of the American diet already more towards uh, plant proteins uh, as a part of uh, an adjustment to health, but it's also an environmentally beneficial change. There was an important commission called the uh, uh, EAT Lancet Commission, E-A-T, which was an acronym, and Lancet, uh, the medical journal, that studied how healthier diets would also be healthy for the planet not only healthy for our bodies. So that's something you can find online that is uh, quite worthwhile. Suffice it to say, we need a comprehensive strategy that goes beyond the energy sector that includes the land use sector as well, including, by the way, uh, uh, stopping the deforestation, which also releases a tremendous amount of CO2 that is now in the vegetation and it puts it into the atmosphere. So there's a lot to be said about that. One final point about food that I would mention is we lose a lot of our food supply to post-harvest losses and uh, post-consumption uh, waste. And so there is a lot of design about how to reduce the losses and waste in the food system, in the food chain, so that we would have a lot less emissions resulting from that because we wouldn't have to be producing as much as we produce 
to get the same amount of uh, intake in our diets if we could cut significantly the 30 or even 40% of the total food supply that is lost in post-harvest or that is wasted uh, after it reaches uh, the, uh, the dining room table. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sachs. Uh, I see that we uh, are over the time that you originally agreed. Uh, are you willing to answer a few more questions? Of course, if we could go to the top of the hour, that would be nice and oh. I don't want to hurry, but I give long answers so we don't get to enough of them. I oh, suppose. that's fine. So top of the hour is a good uh, thing. I would like to ask uh, myself a question. Uh, 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 how are you standing uh, about the Green New Deal, and uh, do you think that uh, Biden's infrastructure plan goes far enough, or would we need to have uh, something a little closer to the originally proposed Green New Deal? What President Biden is doing step by step is uh, to adopt a lot of the principles of uh, the original Green New Deal, which was to decarbonize the US energy system, create good jobs, very important, uh, help with a just transition for communities that would be hard hit and address other social needs like the health system and education. It's not coming in one big piece of legislation, it's coming in steps. So a few weeks ago, uh, the president unveiled his proposals for $2.3 trillion over an eight year period for our physical infrastructure. And a lot of the things that I've been discussing are in that legislation, a lot of financing for green energy, a lot of financing for the transition to electric vehicles, a lot of financing for the retrofitting of buildings, a significant financing for research and development for things like the hydrogen economy. Now, uh, the president is proposing in the next package coming up, and I think he's gonna say something about that tonight in his speech to Congress, uh, some of the anti-poverty measures and relief for student debt, for example. And so this is another component of the Green uh, New Deal. Uh, we need that. We need reform of an overly expensive healthcare system. We definitely need reform of our financing of higher education because it's led to uh, about $1.6 trillion of student debt. And that's all on the agenda as well. Uh, so I expect that uh, and then a third component, I think, is going to be various kinds of industrial policies to support the automotive industry, for example, or to ensure that America has a robust supply chain of batteries for the electric vehicles, because we don't have such a supply chain right now produced in the United States and that the US greatly steps up our production domestically of uh, solar panels and uh, efficient wind turbines and so forth, because we really have not produced the cutting edge technologies for the green economy. They exist. China's producing a lot of them. Uh, Europe is producing some of them, but the United States, because we fell behind, because we weren't uh, pointed in the right direction actually for several years is behind and President Biden's going to be pushing for a jobs program and a manufacturing program that will in effect be an industrial policy to help move towards US production. So I'm quite satisfied, uh, of course, you know, turning this uh, ship of state in a new direction is a big uh, political task. The country is divided. Uh, we have a lot of divisive politics, but I, I very much appreciate the direction that President Biden is taking. I think it's very responsible. Uh, he's a very, very decent and nice person. I, I've known him over 30 years and uh, I admire him and like him very much. So I'm 
very much satisfied with the way that we're going, but it's going to be many, many years of change and it won't come all in one package, uh, but it's gonna come step by step. And I hope that we give this administration the support and the time to get this job done. Thank you. Yeah, um, a truly monumental task. Um, Doc White uh, uh, wrote a uh, question about the sustainable development goals, uh, controlling climate disruption. Are they complicated by human population growth? So uh, we, <laughs> yes, uh, and. Uh, it's, they're still manageable, but let me put it in the following way. I, I've mentioned the start of the industrial age as being around the year 1800. In 1800, the population in the world was about 800 million people. Today, the population is about 8 billion people. Uh, in general, uh, of course, with 8 billion people who need, want, deserve, and merit safe water, safe food, uh, and all the other services, that is a huge, huge challenge. But the population is continuing to rise rather rapidly, especially in one place, uh, and that is in Africa, uh, where the fertility rates remain very high, uh, around uh, five children per woman on average. And the population in Africa now is about 1.4 billion people, but on the UN's estimate could reach about four and a half billion people by 2100, which would be a huge strain for Africa's fragile ecosystems, which are already tremendously strained and which are gonna be even more strained in food supply in the coming years. So I believe that Africa and the world will be well served by Africa succeeding in getting all its kids in school, getting a strong education for every child, uh, and especially because of poverty, the boys have been getting more schooling than the girls, and we need everybody to be getting the good schooling. And the lessons of history are that when the kids are in school and they're getting a good education, they tend to marry later and have fewer children. Fertility rates come down in a voluntary way uh, by the choices of the individuals and the families. And I think that this would ease tremendously for Africa the pathway out of poverty and the path to sustainable development. So my strong advice and hope is SDG4, which is quality education for every child, girl and boy, from pre-K at least through upper secondary school. Because not only is that the empowerment that we need, but it is also, it addresses indirectly the challenge that was raised and that has been recognized by the church also over uh, many encyclicals, starting with the Papa Lorum Progressio uh, in 1967, that uh, we need responsible parenthood. And that means educated families choosing, uh, typically choosing to have fewer children with uh, a later start in marriage and lower fertility. And the evidence is that we would probably see if all kids are in school and rightly getting the education and empowerment and development that they need, the integral development, I think that by the personal choices uh, that people would make, rather than having another 3 billion people in Africa by the end of the century, probably the fertility rates would come down and it would be another billion, uh, perhaps. Uh, so we would reach on the planet nine or nine and a half billion people, a huge challenge, by the way, for everybody to be fed, and to be provisioned and to have energy services and connectivity and all the rest, but it could be accomplished. And that's why I think the sustainable development goals really are about integral
development. And I do see education as the single most empowering of all of the 17 sustainable development goals. It brings us back to the role of universities, but also from pre-K all the way to the universities, the colleges and universities. And education is going to provide the moral insights and the technical insights and the skills for good livelihoods and for sustainability of our societies. Thanks a lot, Dr. Sachs. Uh, we're almost at the hour, so I'm not going to start one more question than we would uh, exceed. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, enlightening um, speech and, uh, and the wonderful answers to uh, the good questions we got from the audience. I'm sorry that we couldn't address them all. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to um, have everybody go behind, get behind uh, the task that we see in front of us. Uh, everybody can help with it uh, in multiple ways. Um, it's a monumental task. Some people say the largest that humanity ever uh, achieved, hopefully achieved. Um, and uh, I think that gives us a, a good uh, guideline what, uh, what we need to look forward to. Thanks again, Dr. Sachs. Tom, let me uh, thank you and thank all of uh, the people that uh, have been together in our discussion this evening. And uh, thanks to uh, Siena Heights University for your leadership. I hope we can continue the discussion together. I'm at sachs at columbia.edu, so please reach out to me. Uh, people that uh, didn't, uh, that have questions uh, that they'd like to continue or comments, I'd be most grateful. But it's really an honor for me to be with you, and I'm uh, just abs absolutely thrilled and delighted uh, at uh, all of uh, your interest and leadership on this issue. Thanks a lot. Uh... So yeah, everybody have a great evening. And uh, we uh, uh, next week at this around the same time, we have the last environmental documentary that uh, of the series. And uh, yeah, uh, stay well, uh, get vaccinated if you're not yet vaccinated, that will help yourself <laughs> and uh, all of us to get over this terrible disease that now at the moment in India is running so badly havoc. And we see if we don't do the right thing, we are breeding resist, uh, germs that might be resistant against our vaccination. So please, everybody do their part to this struggle as well. Thank you and good night to all of you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. What a nice night.